Hello everyone, we're doing a live stream um, covering the event Crime Busters. I'm Megan and this is Claire. Hi everyone. So a brief introduction on the event. Um, the event allows one page notes front and back per participant and it allows a maximum of two participants. And it is highly recommended that you bring the supplies and you can find which supplies you should be or what you can bring via the recommended lab equipment, which can be found on swig.org. A lot of these supplies, if you don't bring them, will put you at a disadvantage when you're doing the event. For safety, this event requires CI protection. You must be wearing a lab coat or an apron, and you must have all skin from neck down to the wrists and ankles to be covered. And if your hair is past your shoulders, make sure it's tied back. The competition portion is usually split into two general sections. You have the first part, which is the evidence, and then you have the second part, which is the write-up slash analysis. So within the evidence, the first big chunk would be the qualitative analysis. This takes up around 50% of the points in the event. Um, it's also split into three sections. There's the solids, non-powdered metals, liquids, and basically, they will give you an unidentified substance in one of these categories, and they will be one of the following as listed on the slide. And you'll have to identify which one it is based on the supplies you bring and the supplies given. To go over some of the methods for that can help you identify each of these substances. For example, in solids, you would be focusing a lot on the physical observations, specifically any um, crystal formation, maybe any coloring. And then of course, they, you, will, you will be provided with distilled water. So check for solubility. And then <clears throat> while you're there, also check for pH. And then you can also check if it's um, reacts with hydrochloric acid and this basically checks to see if there's any acid or stuff like that so you'd be testing for vitamin c among other things and lastly your te um your test would be iodine and iodine test tests for starch so you'd be testing for stuff like cornstarch and then for non-powdered metals, you would also be looking at any physical observations, whether it's shiny or dull. You can also test for density, basing on how it sinks or floats in water, and also check with HCl if it reacts um, with HCl by fizzing. And last thing, you can check if it's magnetic or not with magnets that you are allowed to bring. And the last category would be liquids. Liquids, once again, look at physical properties. Um, also, you can use iodine and pH. However, most liquids have a dead giveaway. For example, lemon juice, you can tell by the color and also the smell. So make sure to focus on these really obvious characteristics of liquids and they'll make um, the qualitative analysis for this portion really helpful. And oftentimes people like to arrange their notes using uh, one of the flow charts as seen on the slide. This makes it easy for your thought process to go through so you know which test to perform first and what that test implies. And a huge tip is that you should know the uses of all of these unknowns because you'll be using these later in the analysis. Okay, so the second part of the evidence is polymers, which takes up 10% of the exam. So there will be three types of polymers you'll have to know about, hair, fibers, and recyclable plastics. So for hair, they'll be asking you to distinguish between human, dog, and cat hair. So the main way you'd be able to do that would be, so for example, dog hair has these black spots called ovoid bodies. So if it has the black spots, it's very likely a dog hair. And then you can tell between like the proportion of the parts of the hair, like the medulla, the cortex, how thick it is, how thin it is, that should help you distinguish. Usually um, they'll either give you a microscope slide and you'll have to observe it yourself or they'll give you pictures of microscope slides. So you have to be able to identify which one it is from the microscope slides. Now for the fibers, usually they'll only ask you to distinguish between an animal vegetable and or synthetic fiber. However, there are some exams that actually do ask you to identify them specifically, but it's not very common. But the if they do, they would usually test cotton, silk, wool, linen, rayon, nylon, and polyester, among others. And either they'll give you pictures of the fibers under a microscope, for example, here. This one's cotton, so you'll have to be able to 
identify the distinguishing characteristic of these fibers under a microscope. Like cotton is like a twisting band. Um, wool is like, it has like a rough kind of looking exterior. All the synthetic fibers look very like um, smooth or they'll give you burn test data or you'll have to actually perform the burn test yourself. However, the burn, like performing the burn test yourself usually only happens at upper level competitions. So at lower level competitions or invitationals, they'll usually give you the data. And the last part is recyclable plastics. So here's the list of plastics that you'll need to know. Um, there will be no burn test conducted. However, they might give you test results. So you'll have to use the test results to identify the plastics. The next section of evidence is about paper chromatography. And for paper chromatography, it's pretty simple. Usually they'll be giving you a pen and then you would be wanting to draw something similar to the first uh, diagram on the left-hand side. And basically you'll have this paper uh, chromatography sheet and then you'll be drawing a line with the pencil. And this is um, going to be marking where your salt youth starts. And then you would be putting a dot with the pen usually and then you can um, put this paper chromatography in the beaker, making sure that it doesn't actually touch the ink blob. So your solvent line comes from um, the water that you'll be using in the beaker. Oftentimes people will prop it up with a stick or maybe tape it up on the beaker so that the water level just touches the tip of the uh, paper chromatography without actually disrupting the ink spot that you placed. And then you would just be letting your chromatography run until it runs pretty much um, till the very top of the paper. And then here you should be able to identify how your paper chromatography will spread, whether it is ink spreading or um, juice spreading. You can also, you should be able to see how uh, it has reacted over this period of time. And from there, you should be able to match up with paper chromatography that has already been given to you or paper chromatography that you have also done previously. Um, and something important to note for the paper chromatography is you wanna start them earlier on because if you don't, then you'll run out of time and the, the solvent won't rise all the way to the top and you won't get an accurate result. Okay, so the next part is crime scene physical evidence, which is 10% of, of the exam. So the first part is fingerprints. They'll ask you to identify different fingerprint types, which would be loop, whirl, or arches. And for the loops, they might split it between ulnar and radial, which basically has to do with the direction the loop is going in. So if it's going towards your ulnar bone, it would be an ulnar loop. And then your radial bone, it would be a radial loop. And then for arches, they might ask you to distinguish between a tented arch and a plain arch. And the difference is just that the tented arch has this delta in the middle and the plain arch does not. So these five, not the last one, these five here would be the main types of um, fingerprints you'd be asked to distinguish. So for all of these sections in the crime scene physical evidence, you kind of want to know some extra information because they might test you on just like some general questions, for example, like, what percentage of people have like a loop or a whirl or an arch? Which one's the most rare? Which one's the most common? You might want to know like here, this is a really popular test question asking about like these very small details in a fingerprint called minutiae. Um, you might want to know like the parts of the skin, stuff like that. Like you want to know this general information because it's not specified in the exam, but they could definitely test you on it. The next part is D DNA evidence. So the most popular one would be this DNA electrophoresis. And basically the way you analyze these is just you have to match up um, which two bands look the most similar. So in this case, it would be the third one and the seventh one here. Wait, no, the sixth one, the third one and the sixth one. So those ones would, since they look identical, you can say that they're from the same um, the same person's DNA. So they might say like um, the third band was found at the crime scene and the sixth band was taken from suspect X. So then you'd be able to say, well, then suspect X must have been at the crime scene. So that's the way you use the DNA evidence. And then shoe prints and tire shreds, they don't show up too often, but basically they'll ask you, to, they'll show you a picture of like a shoe print and then they'll show you a picture of a print made on the ground and they'll ask you like, does the shoe print match? Like where was, they, where were they traveling? Was this like a, a tire or a bike? Stuff like that. And 
no calculations are expected to be performed. Okay, the next part is soil. So usually for soil composition questions, you should use this chart. So have it on your note sheet. And the way you use this is just you look at the percentage of the silt, clay, and sand, and it will, and then you follow like the axes and it'll be able to identify exactly what type of soil it is. You might also want to know some general information, like what size particles makes it a clay, makes it a silt, makes it a sand. You also might want to know the types of um, the layers of soil. Um, and then the last part is spatters. So they'll be asking about blood spatters. So the speed and the direction of impact, but there will be no calculations expected. So some important stuff to know, for example, um, the direction of the spatter always follows the tail. So like in this example here, the tail is pointing northeast. So you can assume that it was traveling northeast when it hit the ground. And then you also want to be able to identify um, the velocity of a blood spatter based on like an image. Um, so here, for example, like high, high velocity would come from like um, a gunshot and then medium velocity would come from like a beating and then low velocity would come from like blunt objects or dripping. And you might also wanna know like exactly what speed would be for each one. Okay, so the last part is the analysis and this is 25% of the exam. And here is where you'll be asked ask to put all the unknowns you've identified and all the crime scene physical evidence and put it together to implicate a suspect and explain why you decided that this suspect was the perpetrator of the crime. So for every crime exam, they'll give you like a background story. That's like the context of all your evidence. They'll say like, that like this question was found here. This question was found like at this location. And then they'll give you a profile of all the suspects, like suspect A, like red hair, is tall, has a cat. Um, and they'll give you a profession and they'll give them their alibi. So you take all the evidence that you found and you have to come up with who you think was a suspect based on like a possible motive and like the powders you found. So for example, let's say suspect A is a baker and you identified cornstarch, sugar and flour to be found at the crime scene. So then you would say, well, these are common ingredients in a bakery. So it's likely that suspect A was the perpetrator because they're a baker. Now, it's important when you're writing your analysis, you have to not only explain why you chose your suspect, but also why the other suspects are innocent. So it's not enough to say suspect A was the perpetrator because X, Y, Z. You have to say um, suspect B, C, D were all innocent because of this reason. And if your other suspects, I mean, if the other suspects have evidence that could possibly like make them look guilty, but you still think it's a different one, you can say, while evidence was found like to implicate this suspect, maybe they were just like there by accident, or here's a possible reason they could have been there without have being the perpetrator of the crime. So make sure you write neatly because this obviously is like one, obviously you can see it's a large part of the exam, almost one fourth. So you want to make sure that the grader can read your, like follow your logic and make sure your writing's legible. And you want to give yourself at least 10 minutes to gather your thoughts and write. Like if you can write fast and you can like figure it out quickly, like by all means, you can give yourself a shorter time, but I would recommend 10 minutes is like a good amount of time. And while it's not necessarily graded on length, it's good to write more than less because you want to provide as much detail as possible to support your argument as much as you can. And finally, make sure you clean up. The cleanup has to be done within the test time. You can't go past the, the timing of the test and not cleaning up results in a 10% penalty. So you have to make sure that you do that. Okay, so that's it for the presentation. Now, if there are any questions. Also, just um, one more quick tip. This event heavily relies on how much you're practicing with your partners. If you're not very coordinated with your partners, it makes it really difficult. Make sure you split up the uh, um, what, who's doing which parts. Usually it's split as someone will take the qualitative analysis and then someone will take the polymers and most of the physical um, evidence and just know that whoever you're partnering with you guys are very um, smooth communication wise your roles are really well defined and you have a lot of practice or when you go to the competition site there's going to be a kind of a panic because they do throw a lot of stuff at you.
Yeah, crime is not like other events where it's like you both have to be extremely knowledgeable on all subjects. This one's more like you should be very good at the parts that you specialize in. So that way the person who's writing the analysis knows that they have all the right information. So there's really much less collaboration during the actual event compared to like study other study events. But yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can just like drop them in the chat or wherever it is that you're watching. <laughs> Okay, so I think we have no questions then, right? Okay, then that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. That's the end of our Crime Busters live stream.